Sometimes when you're scuffling just a little, playing a really bad team can be just what the doctor ordered. And that's what it was for the Orioles this weekend. As Gunnar Henderson went off and the O's swept the Royals to get back on track. I'll recap it all coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast. You are Locked On Orioles, your daily Baltimore Orioles podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, Orioles fans. Today is Monday, June 12th, 2023, and welcome back in to the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, I'm your host, Connor Newcomb. And coming up on today's episode, we are going to recap a huge weekend for the Orioles as they swept the Royals in a three-game series at Oriole Park at Camden Yards, have now won four games in a row and are beating up on the bad competition that they have been playing this season. I'll get you my three big takeaways from the Orioles sweep this weekend, having to do with Gunnar Henderson being fully back and going off at the yard this weekend. The Orioles showing with a mix and match of Anthony Santander, Ryan O'Hearn, and Josh Lester that they can still have a good time and produce if Ryan Mountcastle isn't himself. And then finally talk a little about Cole Irvin as he returned to the Orioles rotation on Saturday. But that's all coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast. Before we get there, though, just did want to thank you for making Locked On Orioles your first podcast listen of the day. We're free and available on all podcast listening platforms. We're also right here on YouTube as well. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe to the Locked On Orioles YouTube channel. And to the YouTube listeners and viewers specifically, as you can see here this week, Back to the normal background, got the video back, got the graphics up, everything. Thank you so much for bearing with me, being patient for the final three episodes of last week. As I mentioned, I was traveling, just wasn't able to get the full video podcast out, but we are back to the normal video, normal audio, back to everything, back at home here this week with the Orioles. And we thank you for making Locked on Orioles your first podcast listen of the day. For your first listen today, it's an Orioles sweep over the Royals taking game one on Friday night by a score of three to two, coming back out and winning six to one on Saturday. And then the O's completed the sweep with a thumping of the Royals 11 to three on Sunday. And the O's get to 41 and 24 on the season have now won four games in a row, still sitting in second because the Rays took a series from the Rangers this weekend and they still play great baseball, but Orioles still with one of the best records in all of baseball and Listen, they beat up on a bad team again this weekend, ended up winning five out of six in the season series against the Royals. And I'm going to get you my three big takeaways from the weekend. And we start with the one that was, well, I would think everybody's biggest takeaway from this weekend is that after a slow start to the season and some rough times for the rookie, Gunnar Henderson is back. This is the Gunnar Henderson we knew that we would see at some point this season. For everybody who wanted to send him down to AAA, Thought he wasn't good and he needed to regroup or revamp his stuff or whatever it may be. This is the Gunnar Henderson we knew was in there. And he was still productive when he wasn't hitting because he was walking so much. But this is a different player. In the three games this weekend for Henderson, all three were multi-hit games. He goes eight for 13 with a double, two homers, and four RBIs. He had seven hard hit balls on the weekend, which means not really any of his hits were cheapies. Two strikeouts to no walks. And I do want to first pinpoint that, right? Because first of all, two strikeouts in three games, good to see for Henderson, but also interesting for him not to walk in what was easily his best series of the season. What really kept Gunnar Henderson in the lineup throughout his struggles this year is how much he was walking, the plate discipline, the ability to still get on base at a well over 300 clip, despite hitting 180 for most of the year. And it's interesting to see, well, he didn't walk this weekend, and yet he had his best series of the year. Well, what that tells me is he's still going to walk this year, and it's still going to be a big part of his game. But maybe he just took that aggressiveness to another level this weekend and said, you know what? I'm swinging earlier in counts. I'm going after those pitches I can drive. And the walks are still going to come, but maybe a great weekend without a walk is an even better thing for Gunner to show, hey, you don't have to get to the fifth, sixth, seventh pitch in the count before you attack. You can attack early and still do damage. That's exactly what Gunner Henderson did this weekend. And the month of June has just been 
really a different player. In seven games in June for Henderson, he is 11 for 24. That is a 458 batting average with a double, four home runs in those seven games, seven RBIs, one walk to five strikeouts, and he has two stolen bases in that stretch as well. He's just been swinging it so well. And really, it's been about a month now that Henderson's been swinging it this well. We sit here on June 12th. If you go back to May 13th, so basically about a month, on May 13th, Gunner bottomed out at a 170 batting average for the season. That was his lowest had gotten all year. Since then, he had a one for three the next day, and including that May 13th game, Gunner is hitting 321 in that stretch with a 1015 OPS. That's an OPS over 1,000 with six home runs in that stretch as well in about a month. He is the player we saw in September last year. Quite frankly, this last month has been better than the player we saw in September last year when he was called up. And this is just so huge for the Orioles' offense. In general, it's huge for the, huge for the O's' offense, but especially right now. Because when you are without Cedric Mullins, and the O's got some good news on Cedric Mullins this weekend. He is in Sarasota. He has started baseball activities. Now, he hasn't started hitting or anything like that, I don't think. But he started baseball activities, which means he's starting the process to get back to the big leagues. Hopefully by July, the O's can have him back. But in the meantime, you needed a left-handed hitter to provide some power, provide some on-base, provide a good average, play good defense, steal some bases. Henderson's doing all that. And yes, Aaron Hicks is helping, that he's playing a great center field and hitting well. He's reached base in every game since he joined the Orioles, and he had a solid weekend as well. But specifically where Henderson helps is Brandon Hyde put him into the leadoff spot this weekend. Now, he didn't hit leadoff against the lefty on Friday, and that's okay. He hit seventh on Friday. Austin Hayes hitting the leadoff spot. And I think that's how the O's are going to do it until Mullins returns. You'll probably see Gunnar Henderson leading off against righties. Hayes leading off against lefties, but they'll both still play in every single lineup. They won't sit for platoons. And Henderson still has struggled against lefties overall. 195 average, 548 OPS, no homers against lefties this year, but he had a couple of hits against the Royals left-handed starter Daniel Lynch on Friday night, so that was certainly a good sign hitting out of the seven hole. But he just, he looks like a different guy right now. He looks like the guy we know he can be at just 21 years old. And I think he's kind of perfect for the leadoff role. Now, I don't think he'll stay there when Mullins comes back. I do think Cedric Mullins is back in that role. But for now, he seems to be that perfect fill-in. Because yes, he can get on base, but he can also provide that pop. And so maybe now that he's swinging it this well, maybe you do want to move him down the order just a little bit so he's in RBI chances. But you look at the lineup, Adam Frazier did not do well when he was stuck into that leadoff spot. He kind of started slumping right around when Mullins went down. But if you can get this from Gunner in the leadoff spot, you can have Adley hit second. Then you got Santander, who's swinging the bat well again, hitting in that three-hole. And then you mix and match behind there. I'm liking the look at the top of that Orioles order. And Henderson just seemed like the perfect fit there. And not only did he have this great weekend, right? Getting these key hits, eight for 13. But he played good defense. He was at third base in the game on Friday night, hitting the seven-hole. In that one, but we got to see him play a little bit of shortstop this weekend as well. We've seen it a little more lately as Jorge Mateo has struggled. He played third on Friday and Saturday, but he got the start at short on Sunday as Mateo got the day off and looked good over there as well. But specifically, I mean, the swing to cap off the weekend, the three run homer in the seventh inning on Sunday that basically put the game away, put the Orioles up 10 to three at that time. I was in the ballpark Sunday. I was sitting down the first baseline. That ball had a different sound as it flew out towards Utah Street. Henderson hit it 462 feet for a three-run homer, 113.8 miles per hour off the bat. And according to Andy Costco of the Baltimore Banner on Twitter on Sunday, it was the longest home run ever hit to Utah Street at Oriole Park at Camden Yards. That is insane. And every time Gunner does something like that, he just shows us more and more. He is a special, special player. That first month and a half of the year, that was not him. That was just him going through a little sophomore slump. Guys adjusting to him. He has adjusted back. Major League Baseball, look out. Gunner's back. Adley's still there. And the Orioles are out for blood this season. 
But Gunnar Henderson wasn't the only one in the lineup who played a big role this week. And the Orioles actually were missing Ryan Mountcastle, who was out with an illness. And they've kind of been missing him for a while now. as He's been pretty bad over the last month or so. So they had some other guys step in, in the lineup and at first base. And those guys all really produced. So coming up next, we'll talk about how the Orioles right now with Mountcastle sick and struggling at the plate. They're kind of set up to handle that loss well and fill in for the lost production during the struggles and other things happening with Ryan Mountcastle. But first, this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is brought to you by eBay Motors. For a championship team, it's all about making sure every player is a perfect fit. It's the same when it comes to your vehicle. Every part needs to fit just right. So the next time you need parts and accessories, head to eBay Motors. With eBay Guaranteed Fit, you can be sure every part you need fits right the first time around. Just add your ride to my garage and look for the green check to know the part will fit or your money back. Because just like in sports, confidence is the name of the game when you shop on eBay Motors. And with over 122 million parts to choose from, you'll be back in the game in no time. After all, it's easy to bring home a win when the right parts are guaranteed. So get the right parts, the right fit, and the right prices on ebaymotors.com. Let's ride. eBay guaranteed fit, only available to U.S. customers, eligible items only, exclusions apply. So the Orioles sweep the Kansas City Royals over the weekend, taking all three games to get to 41 and 24 on the season. And I got to say, with the Royals having now lost 9 out of 10, And seven in a row. And the Oakland A's, who just went in and swept the Brewers and have now won five in a row. I'm going to say it right now. I know the Royals still have a better record. I think the Royals might be worse than the A's. That's how bad that team looked this weekend. But the O's still got it done. You still got to beat the bad teams. That's what the Orioles did in April when they got out to that great start. That's what they did here against Kansas City. And they did it without Ryan Mountcastle, who did not play at all in the three games this weekend. Now. I get that the way Mountcastle's been hitting, not the biggest loss, right? Last 15 games for Mountcastle, it's been a real, real struggle. And really the month of May and beyond, not kind to him. But specifically the last 15 games he's played in, 158 average, 231 on base, 228 slugging, just one home run in that time. It's a 459 OPS and 20 strikeouts to just four walks in those 15 games. He hasn't been seeing the ball well. He's not making his quality contact. It just hasn't been good for Ryan Mountcastle. And he was sitting a couple of days last week. Then it comes out that, you know, he's dealing with something illness-wise, and because of that, he did not play all weekend. Now, Brandon Hyde did say that Mountcastle did take swings in the cage on Sunday before the game, and he said although he wasn't in the lineup, he may have been available. Now, the O's didn't need him. They blew out the Royals 11-3, to but he may have been available. So with the off day today, it makes me think that potentially – Mountcastle could be ready for this Toronto series starting on Tuesday, which would be a perfect time for him to get back to the lineup, right? Because if there's anybody Ryan Mountcastle loves hitting against, it's the Toronto Blue Jays, a team he has just sautéed throughout his career. So if there's an opponent he's going to get going against, it's going to be the Blue Jays, and I'd like to see him in the lineup this week against Toronto. But if that doesn't work, that doesn't get him going, if he continues to struggle, you know, if he's only going to play against lefty, he's still got an OPS over a thousand against lefties this year. So Mountcastle is still having success there. Or if he's, you know, still dealing with his illness, whatever it may be, this weekend showed that the Orioles in their lineup, they can deal with a loss of Ryan Mountcastle at this moment. Anthony Santander, Ryan O'Hearn, and Josh Lester all played first base this weekend and all contributed at the plate as well. Santander, who was in a one for 25, you know, earlier this month, leading back into May, had the big RBI double late in the game on Thursday in the win over the Brewers, and then had a nice weekend, four for 11 with three doubles, two RBIs. He had a huge game on Saturday, drew a couple of walks, just one strikeout, and he got to start at first base. Santander was in there with Mountcastle out. They said, all right, go play some first base on Friday, and he rose to the occasion, and he said, all right, I'll play a little first base on Saturday as well. And that continued. He got to DH on Sunday, but he looks fine over there defensively. He's not going to make stellar plays. And we really haven't had to see him field many grounders, if any at all, over there at first. But in terms of picking the ball, making the stretches, he seems fine over there at first base. Then you have Ryan O'Hearn. 
And he played a little first this weekend, played a little outfield as well for the Orioles. Had a ball he probably should have caught in the first inning of Sunday's game that led to an RBI double, but no harm, no foul. Orioles went at 11 to 3. But Ryan O'Hearn, I mean, we need to seriously, I need to seriously, and I've been talking about him a bit, but more seriously, talk about Ryan O'Hearn. He did not play with the lefty on the mound Friday against his old team, but against his former team, the Royals, who cut him loose this offseason after five years in the big leagues. They could have kept him. They just non-tendered him off the roster. O'Hearn goes five for five this weekend with a double, a homer, two RBIs, and two walks. Just cranked a home run to tack on that 11th run on Sunday. Just had some big hits, big RBI single in the game on Saturday, that home run he hit was fun to watch. 108 off the bat, 390 feet to right field on Sunday. He's just been fun to watch. And Ryan O'Hearn now, after the game on Sunday. Now, he's not a qualified hitter. Just he doesn't have enough at-bats. He spent a lot of the year on the bench, spent a little bit of time in AAA this season. Just hasn't played consistently enough. But he's now hitting 328 with a 989 OPS. That leads all Orioles. Now, if you were a qualified hitter, He'd be up there near the top of the American League in those statistics, specifically with a 328 average. He's been so good off the bench. And the big thing with O'Hearn is if the Orioles do need to sit Ryan Mountcastle a little longer, maybe they need to have like kind of a platoon where Mountcastle plays against all the lefties and some of the righties, and then O'Hearn plays against the rest of the righties and sits against the lefties. I think the Orioles could make that happen because Ryan O'Hearn, whatever change they made, and I've talked about this, you know, he was really struggling at the plate over the last couple of years with the Royals. Whatever change the Orioles made, it has worked. And he is a different hitter. He's hitting for power. He's got a great eye at the plate. He's only swinging at good pitches. You know, the 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 big push by the Orioles for those swing decisions apparently is caught up to Ryan O'Hearn in these first couple of weeks with the O's. I mean, Ryan O'Hearn hit fourth for the Baltimore Orioles on Sunday. They put out a lineup with O'Hearn hitting fourth. And I didn't bat an eye. That's how good he's been this season. Now he hit fourth because Adley Rutschman got the full day off just the second time he's gotten the full day off this year. And of course, Cedric Mullins is injured. But Ryan O'Hearn hitting fourth, and I was like, yeah, okay, that makes sense. And then he went three for three with a homer and two doubles. Scored four runs on the day. I mean, this guy's reaching base all five times. That's insane for a bench guy. He was basically traded, got nothing, or, or traded him for nothing. They ended up with Ryan O'Hearn for cash considerations after the Royals cut him loose. It was a good job by the Orioles to find Ryan O'Hearn. I don't know if he could sustain this, but this is fun to watch. And then you just got to shout out to Josh Lester. I mean, I was a little surprised that the Orioles, you know, when Danny Coulomb returned off the bereavement list last week, that instead of sending Lester back down, they sent Taron Vavra down and they kept Josh Lester. Now, he can play some other positions, which helps, and he's probably a better hitter than Taron Vavra, at least from a power perspective. And Josh Lester this weekend, three for eight, a couple of RBIs, a strikeout, had a big two-run single early in the game on Sunday, kind of started to to pad the lead in the third inning for the Orioles. I just really like what I'm seeing from all these guys. And Lester's not going to be an everyday player, and O'Hearn's not going to play against lefties. But they got a good group right now. So if it continues that it's Mountcastle's struggles or it's an illness or whatever it may be, I hope he's, he's getting better with whatever's going on there. But... If those struggles continue, they've got guys in place. And if Mountcastle heats back up again, which I'm convinced he will, he's been a very streaky hitter his whole career, he'll go on a crazy hot streak, then you can fit these guys in other places. Santander still plays right. O'Hearn can still DH, play the outfield. Lester can DH for you if you need him. That's the best part, maybe, of this Orioles team, the versatility and the depth of the lineup. And they showed it off once again in the sweep over the Royals this weekend. But the one thing we haven't talked about so far on this pod is pitching. I mean, you're like, come on, Connor. The Orioles gave up six runs in three games. I know the Royals are one of the worst offenses in baseball, but remember the Royals the last time they played this series, I mean, they had over 20 runs against the Orioles in the three games. They gave up six runs, give them some credit. So coming up next to finish off the pod, we will talk pitching, specifically starting pitching and specifically the return of Cole Irvin as a starter for the Orioles as he got the ball on Saturday. 
So the Orioles swept the Kansas City Royals over the weekend, allowing only six runs in the series. It was a close game that they had to hold on to on Friday. Felix Bautista had a nasty ninth inning, but then they pulled away late Saturday and just completely bludgeoned them on Sunday. And a really good series sweep to look at this team and say, you know what? This Royals team is really, really bad. Let's go after them. And that's exactly what they did. And we've talked a lot about the offense, but, you know, they had an 11-run game. You know, I mean, 20 runs in a weekend, that's, that's, that's a good output. But also to give up only six is very impressive, even when it is a, a struggling offense like the Royals. And my third and final big takeaway from the weekend is that, you know, Cole Irvin, him coming back, and he wasn't amazing, but he was good, just kind of settled this rotation a little bit. Because since really the struggles of Grayson Rodriguez really started with that, I would say that first series in Kansas City against the Royals when he, you know, didn't make it out of the fourth inning and gave up eight runs, it's been a little unsettled. And then specifically, when the Orioles set Rodriguez down, they did that bullpen game against Cleveland that was a disaster, and they were able to skip the spot. They were going with four starters for a while. Well, they called up Nick Vespi and, and optioned Bruce Zimmerman on Friday. They didn't use Vespi Friday. Then they optioned Vespi and called up Cole Irvin on Saturday to make the start and return to the Orioles for his fourth start of the year. Now, we know how bad it was early in the season. Orioles trade for Irvin from the Oakland Athletics in the offseason. First three starts, he has an ERA over 10. Orioles send him down to AAA. He marinates down there for a while. He comes up one time in mid-May to give them a long relief option. He pitches in one game out of the bullpen in Toronto, goes back down, starts some more games in AAA, and he was good. I mean, he had a 3-2 ERA in AAA Norfolk in seven starts, so he was pitching well. And he returns and just, listen, it wasn't like this amazing dominant thing. And He didn't pitch super deep into the game, which is kind of what you get Cole Irvin to do. But it was a great step forward for Irvin, who had been just so bad early in the year. Irvin, in the start on Saturday, goes five and a third innings, allowing one run on six hits. He struck out five, didn't walk anyone, no home runs, threw only 72 pitches, but he did give up eight hard-hit balls, and he had 10 whiffs in that game on Saturday. Now, I did see a lot of questioning, well, why did the Orioles pull him when they did? Well, he had been getting hit hard in the first four innings, had survived without giving up a run. Then he was getting hit real hard in the fifth when the Royals scored their one run against him. And then to the two batters he faced in the sixth, well, they hit him hard too. So even though he was at 72 pitches, Brandon Hyde had a fairly rested bullpen after Tyler Wells had gone six and two-thirds innings on Friday night. And even though he didn't have Felix Bautista or Yenye Cano available, pretty much everybody else was on regular rest and ready to go. And Hyde, I think, made the right decision saying, you know what, Irvin's getting hit. If we let this go on too long, I mean, if you remember, it was it was only a four to one game at that point. The Royals could have easily kind of snuck their way back into that thing. And so I thought he made the right decision, and the bullpen did a good job between Brian Baker, Austin Voth, who struggled a little bit, but then CNL Perez, a huge five outs, and Mike Bauman locks it down for that six to one win on Saturday. But it was just nice to see Irvin do well. And again, I'm giving this the caveat. You know, this is not a good offense, the Royals. But Irvin was terrible early in the year. Remember, he faced the athletics. Not a good offense either. And they bludgeoned him in his last start before he was sent down. But Irvin goes up there, as I mentioned, 10 whiffs on 41 swings. And the big thing was the sinker. The sinker was a pitch he did not throw super often in his first three starts with the Orioles. But that changed. For Cole Irvin, in this start, the sinker was his number one pitch that he threw on Saturday. 29 of his 72 pitches, just about 40% were sinkers. Then he went 16 four-seamers, 15 change-ups, 10 curveballs, and two cutters. And the sinker got four whiffs on it. He was all around the strike zone all day. The four-seamer was in the zone as well when he needed it to be. Got a couple of swings and misses on the curveball and the change-up as well. But generally just a good mix to keep the Royals off balance. And even his velocity was a little bit up on some of his pitches as well from what it was when he was here earlier with Baltimore at the beginning of the season. And I, you know, I, I don't know what the future holds for Cole Irvin this year. Grayson Rodriguez was not called up to make this start because it hadn't been 15 days yet since he was demoted and there was no player going on the injured list for him to replace. So he couldn't come up for Saturday's game. Now, I believe this Tuesday will be the date that hits where Grayson can come up again. And Grayson was great in his second AAA start since going down. Friday night, he struck out 10 batters over six innings. He had 28 whiffs 
in six innings, which is just an absurd number. He got a lot of them on all of his different pitches. All five sliders that those AAA hitters swung at Friday night were swings and misses. So his off-speed stuff was looking better, using the fastball a lot too, but still the stuff was good. So he's getting closer and closer to, to being ready to come back up. So you will have a Cole Irvin, Grayson Rodriguez question. I do think for now, Irvin probably is going to get at least one more start. I mean, he'd be set up to pitch most likely this Saturday in Chicago against the Cubs. Not a super tough offense to face. And by that time, you'll see one more AAA start out of Grayson Rodriguez. That would give him three since being demoted. And if that one's good as well, you'll have another decision to make potentially depending on how Irvin pitches in his next start. But for now... At the very least, he settles this rotation a little bit, gives them a fifth starter, and they feel like, okay, we can trust you. And maybe now after five and a third, one run, you just kind of get his feet wet back in the bigs again. Maybe against the Cubs this weekend, well, they can push him a little further, try to get him through six or seven innings like he did so, so many times with Oakland over the past two years. And then maybe you get the Cole Irvin you thought you were getting when you acquired him via trade this offseason. And that gives you a good problem to have. Because then you can have five starters you're generally relying on and Grayson Rodriguez ready to go in AAA. That's where the O's want to be right now. And we'll see if that happens. And I mean, stable lines in the rotation, you know, it's not just on Irvin. It's on the other guys pitching well. And the other guys did pitch well, too. I mentioned Tyler Wells on Friday night. Didn't have as many strikeouts as he's been putting together. But six and two-thirds innings, two runs, five hits, four Ks, and a walk on 92 pitches. Wells now at a 3-2-4 ERA. He's just been great this year. Only seven whiffs Friday night. Didn't really have his swing and miss stuff, but it didn't really matter. And then on Sunday, Kyle Gibson pitched fairly deep into a game as well. Six and a third innings, three runs, seven hits, four Ks, a, no walks, and a home run. Now the Royals did, um, we'll say, square up Gibson just a little bit. They did have 12 hard hit balls against him in six and a third innings, but he pitched around a, a bunch of singles and, and got himself out of there and I mean, honestly, just a, a shout out to Keegan Aiken before ending this podcast. I mean, Aiken relieved Gibson in the seventh. Keegan Aiken finished the game two and two thirds scoreless, one hit, no walks, six strikeouts for Keegan Aiken with 10 whiffs. By far the best he has looked all year. And he threw 26 out of 36 pitches were four seam fastballs and the Royals had no chance against him. And I've kind of been writing off Keegan Aiken saying, all right, whenever the O's make their next pitching move, it's probably going to be Aiken that goes down. He tried to put his foot down on Sunday. I'll tell you, the Orioles love that. Listen, because when you only use Aiken and Gibson on Sunday, then you have the off day here on Monday. Well, the O's set up really, really well to take on Toronto this week at the yard. But the Orioles pull off the sweep, get your brooms out. Big weekend for the Orioles against Toronto. The Royals. That'll do it for today's episode. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'll be back tomorrow. Remember, off day here on Monday, so no game to recap on tomorrow's episode, but got a fun episode planned. We are just about a month away from the All-Star game. It'll be July 11th in Seattle. And the Orioles have some candidates who certainly should be going, and then some other candidates who could play their way in with a good couple of weeks here coming up. So on tomorrow's episode, we'll break down... The Orioles who could go to the All-Star Games, the guys who are locks, the guys who could go, and the guys who maybe have an outside chance if they put something together here in the month of June. But that's all coming up on tomorrow's episode. Until then, I'm Connor Newcomb, and this has been the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.